We often hear on the news about oil and oil rich countries such as Saudi Arabia and other countries like that. Now what actually is that oil? Because if we took the oil from the ground and put it into our cars, our cars would not go anywhere. They would not be able to deal with the different substances which are contained in that oil. And that is a clue right there. We call the oil crude oil. Crude oil means that we haven't done anything to refine it or perfect it if you like. And crude oil is actually a mixture of many, many different compounds. So a mixture of compounds. Now, many of these compounds are very useful as fuels. And that is why oil is such a massive money substance. But we do first need to treat the crude oil in order to obtain those useful compounds. And the big term here is that most of these compounds, or in fact almost all of these compounds, are hydrocarbons. Now notice I don't say 100% of the compounds in there are hydrocarbons because you will have impurity, but the useful ones are hydrocarbons. But what is a hydrocarbon? Well it is exactly as it sounds, it is a compound which is rich in carbon and hydrogen. And I'll draw the most simple one for you, which is methane. You'll have heard of methane, probably for all the wrong reasons. It comes out of cows, because cows are farting all the time. But it is actually a component of crude oil as well. So methane, what we have is a central carbon surrounded by these four hydrogens, like that. And this is methane. And so we could write the chemical formula as C, because there's one carbon, and how many hydrogens? Well, four. So we've got a molecule, CH4, which is methane. Now, you know it would be quite silly to think of cows as farting out oil or fuel, because methane is a gas at room temperature, and that's why you can't see what's coming out of a fart of a cow. But methane is a gas, and not going in it too much, but the reason methane is a gas is because this molecule is so small. It's only one carbon and it's four hydrogen. You'll come on to intermolecular forces later on in the next course, but for now, just think the smaller the hydrocarbon, the more likely it's gonna be a gas. If I had something which was say C, I don't know, C12H26, that would be way more likely to be a liquid or even a solid, it depends, most likely a liquid purely because it's way bigger. But to get you used to it, let's have a look at another one. You may have heard of a substance called ethane. Ethane is C2H6, and all it is, is similar to methane, we have central carbon atoms with hydrogens all around them. Now you'll notice that each carbon isn't bound to four hydrogens this time, because if we go up methane, the carbon is bound to four, whereas in this case, the carbon is bound to three hydrogens. That is because one of those bonds is taken up binding to another carbon. And this is something very common. So ethane, and it's C2H6. It is one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens and two carbons. Now you might be noticing a pattern already, but I'm gonna draw the next one for you. And that is known as propane. Propane has three carbons, so one, two, three, and then we just surround all these carbons with hydrogen, like so, hydrogen, there we go. And so if we count, we've got three carbons, and how many hydrogens? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight hydrogens. That's known as propane. You don't need to remember these names, by the way, so don't worry about those. And just to demonstrate the point, I'll draw the fourth one as well, which is called butane. So we have four carbons, one, two, three, four, and each of those is surrounded by hydrogens, like so. And so we have C4 this time, and H, how many? Well, if you count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. C4, H10, and that is known as butane. And so let's summarize the chemical here so you can see the pattern. Well, we're not going to use that 12, 26, but we could do. We have C, H4, C2, 
H6, C3, H8, and C4, H10. Now try and pause the video and come up with a pattern, because there is a pattern here, and we can work out the amount of hydrogens if we know the amount of carbons, and vice versa. Okay, so I hope you had a go. Well, the pattern is quite clear. Each carbon is bound to two hydrogens above and below it, okay? Above and below, above, below, above, below. And then you'll always have an extra hydrogen on the far end of each side of the molecule. So, two hydrogens for every carbon. So we can say times your amount of carbons by two, and then add the two end ones, and then you've got your answer. And so that will even work for methane, because methane, here we are, has one above, one below, and then you add on your two for the end. And so that means we can actually construct a formula where we have C, and we denote it the number N. N just means how many carbons you have. So CN, H, 2N, because remember we have two hydrogens for every carbon, one above, one below. And then we have a hydrogen on each end of the molecule. So we add another two hydrogens. So we have a general formula of CNH2N plus 2. And that is for this class of molecules, which are known as the alkanes. Now we call alkanes the saturated hydrocarbons. So they are saturated hydrocarbons. And you, you will have heard this term before. This is actually the same principle as when we have saturated and unsaturated fats. We won't go into that at the moment, but saturated in this sense just means every bond that can be made is made and that there are no double bonds. And just so that's clear, I'll show you in another color. If we had two carbons next to each other, okay, they are bound by a single bond which you can see from this line here. Okay, this is a single covalent bond. If they were bound by a double bond, we would write that like this. And remember, each carbon can have four bonds. And this double bond actually counts as two bonds. And so that means each carbon can only bind two more times to hydrogens. And that means that this hydrocarbon here, which is actually called ethene, which I'll go through in a later video, this one here is not an alkane, it is not a saturated hydrocarbon, because we have a double bond which stops each carbon binding to as many hydrogens or other carbons as it can. And like I say, I'll go through the alkenes in a later video. And so just to demonstrate, if we go back to our diagram of the alkanes, have a look at every single carbon. Every single carbon has four separate bonds. There are no double bonds, and therefore each of these hydrocarbons is an alkane and it is saturated. It is saturated because every carbon is bound to four other things, if you like. So either three other hydrogens and a carbon, two carbons and two hydrogens, or in the case of methane, four hydrogens. And so now a question for you to try. Pause the video. If you had a hydrocarbon with nine carbons, how many hydrogens would it have? And so when I say hydrocarbon, I mean an alkane. So we're gonna be using this formula up here. So how many hydrogens would this alkane have which has nine carbons? Pause the video and have a go, and we'll go through it after. Okay, so I hope you got it. Basically, we have a look at this formula here, and we see that N, in this case, is the number nine. So the number of carbons is nine. The formula to work out how many hydrogens we've got is, I'll do it over here, is two N, so two lots of nine, and then add two at the end. And now two lots of nine is 18. And then we add our two. 18 plus two will give us a total of 20 hydrogens. So the molecule is going to be C9H20. So nine carbons and 20 hydrogens.
Right, so I hope that explanation has cleared up what an alkane is and what a, what a hydrocarbon is. So now we're going to go on to have a look at how we separate all of these different hydrocarbons from crude oil. Because crude oil will be a mixture of all of these different hydrocarbons and loads of other ones and we need to separate them because each one might be useful for a different purpose. So the method we actually use is known as fractional distillation. Now you might have heard the term before or you might have just heard the term distillation before. Now fractional distillation is exactly the same as distillation except we use a piece of equipment which allows us to separate more than two things all in one go. So distillation is normally a mixture of two different compounds and we separate them as a result of their varying boiling points. Important here that you don't say melting points because what we actually separate them based on is the boiling point. So I'll put that in red to highlight very important. Boiling points. So let's have a look now at the fractional distillation column itself. Now this is the piece of apparatus which we will use in order to separate the different fractions, as we call them, and we separate them out of the crude oil. So as you can see, the, fr the crude oil is going to come in this way. It enters a furnace in order to heat it up because we are going to begin with almost everything from the crude oil being a gas. And this is why I mentioned that it's important to remember it's boiling point and not melting point. So we pump in the crude oil, it becomes a gas, and the bottom is around about 400 degrees Celsius. Almost all of the fractions will be a gas at this temperature. Some of them, however, won't, and they are really thick, stodgy things which will be down the bottom and will still be a, a gloopy liquid. And these flow out of the bottom and they can be collected and so that's lubricating oil, paraffin wax, asphalt. They can be used for things like tarmac on the roads because they don't melt at high temperatures. So if there's a crash, then it means that the road isn't going to melt. Okay, as you can see, we have different levels at different temperatures. So as you go up the column, the column gets cooler and cooler and cooler. Now it's important to note that this column isn't the only one you could use. You could have one which was way more specific, and let's say above was 390, 380, 70, so on. It just depends on how precise you want to be with extracting your fraction. And so this one has only got a few levels just to make it simple. But if there is a gas from the crude oil which has a boiling point between 400 degrees, which is the bottom, and 370 degrees, so let's say for example it has a boiling point of 380 degrees, that means at 380 that is when it will become a gas. Any temperature above 380 then this compound will be a gas. So at 370 degrees, which is this level, that compound is not at a high enough temperature to be a gas and so it will actually turn into a liquid, it will condense. And so when it condenses, we stop backflow down the tube, so the liquid can't just trickle down to the bottom, it will condense and it will actually run out here. Okay, and we can collect it here. And it's told you here that this is indicative of fuel. So this will be some kind of high energy fuel, perhaps fuel which powers jets, so fighter planes or even jumbo jets and the like. It's not, however, going to be petrol because car oil boils at a much lower temperature. We don't have in our car engines anything which is burning at around 370 degrees Celsius. Okay, but everything else in the crude oil which hasn't yet condensed is still a gas and will carry on rising up the chamber. Some will hit 300 degrees Celsius and they will have a boiling point between 370 and 300 degrees Celsius. These will then trickle out here because they will condense into a liquid and they will trickle out here. And one example of what leaves at around about 300 degrees Celsius is diesel. Okay, and then of course the same process, everything that doesn't condense there, so everything with an even lower boiling point will carry on moving up the column and it will leave here or here when it reaches a temperature which is below its boiling point. 
So at temperatures below the boiling point of a fuel, that fuel will become a liquid. If it was a gas to start with, that fuel will condense. Now one more important thing to note is that these fractions, so the fractions that we have produced, a lot of the time we don't use a distillation column which is extremely precise. So therefore, using the range of temperatures that we do, we may get multiple molecules or multiple different hydrocarbons in one fraction. So fractions must be processed in order for us to obtain our fuel. So to obtain our fuel. And processing may mean separating some of the hydrocarbons and it can also mean separating out some impurities. So if you have a look up here, at 300 degrees Celsius, diesel oil will condense and be collected. That diesel oil may contain other hydrocarbons which we actually don't want, and it may also contain impurities which we need to separate out. Okay, now I'm gonna stop there. If you have any questions, please do post them in the comment box below, and I will see you in the next video.